Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. This week was a wild one, starting with a big RTX 3090 Ti GPU launch from Nvidia and continuing with Intel finally getting some ARC GPUs into the hands of consumers in mobile trim, admittedly. And maybe they're starting small, but at least they dropped a bunch of solid info on the architecture as well. And a look at what we're assuming will be the reference design for Alchemist add-in boards. AMD seems to be on track for their next gen Ryzen 7000 CPUs later in the year too, but perhaps the best news this week, apart from even more GPU price drops, is that the worst day to be on the internet, also known as April Fool's Day, is now behind us. The timer is reset, and we have about 363 days of peace until our social media feeds are assaulted yet again with the overwrought brain children of underpaid creative marketing teams from tech companies across the world. Sure, there may be one or two marginally humorous or clever standouts from the parade of ineptitude that shambles by each year, but you've got to ask yourself, is the trade-off worth it? No, no, it's definitely not. Excellent! Today's video is brought to you by the Corsair K70 RGB Pro Mechanical Gaming Keyboard, powered by Axon Processing Technology and Genuine Cherry MX Mechanical Switches. This board packs its aluminum frame with features like dynamic per-key RGB lighting, a detachable USB Type-C cable, durable PBT double-shot keycaps, and IQ software support on both PC and Mac OS. You also get dedicated media keys, a multi-function volume roller, onboard storage for up to 50 profiles and more. So for further details on the Corsair K70 RGB Pro, click the sponsor link in the video description. Let's start with GPUs today. There are some very small ones and there are some big ones. Let's go small first. Intel hosted their big ARC GPU announcement stream on Wednesday morning, but for me the most exciting part wasn't the GPUs that are actually launching. It was this, about 45 second animation showing the new A series or Alchemist desktop GPU design for the first time. The GPU, which apparently self-assembles using nanobots like the Mark 50 Iron Man suit, features a sleek dual fan shroud and a clean overall design with rounded corners, some chrome trim around the edges, and a backplate that continues the arc theme with a series of curved lines. There's apparently an illuminated Intel Arc logo on the side and Intel Arc Limited Edition on the backplate, which we're assuming means that Intel will produce these reference design models in limited quantities and that board partners will still have plenty of third-party designs on offer. Or who knows, maybe Intel's really just gonna make 50 of these GPUs in total and then be like, haha guys, fooled you. Now we are also assuming that this uh, bit of a gap here in the middle of the fin stack is likely where a 12VH power connector will be because Intel seems to have taken notes from Nvidia by making a pretty nice looking initial design and then ruining it by sticking an awkward two or three way power adapter dongle front and center. Unfortunately, we'll have to wait until summer to find out, which could still be a lot long way off. Because if you didn't notice, Intel promised this initial ARC launch in Q1, and then they waited until March 30th, the second to last day of that three month period to make good on their commitment. Summer 2022 starts on June 21st and ends September 22nd, for us sensible folk who live in the Northern Hemisphere at least, meaning desktop ARC and the larger sized mobile ARC GPUs waiting on deck might not arrive until well after school is back in session this year. That said, Intel did share some solid information, including the two initial variants of their Alchemist die, which many GPU variations will be derived from and is produced on TSMC's N6 node. The ACM G11 is what's launching now. It will power ARC 3 designs with up to 8 XE cores and 8 ray tracing units, as well as 4 megs of L2 cache, a 96-bit GDDR6 memory interface, PCIe Gen 4x8 connectivity, and the same media and display engine configuration as the big brother ACM G10, which which will power ARC 5 and ARC 7 configurations. The bigger chip has up to 32 XE cores and 32 ray tracing units with 16 megs of cache, a 256-bit GDDR6 memory interface, and PCIe Gen 4x16 connectivity. This chart shows all the upcoming ARC mobile GPUs with the ARC 3 A350M and A370M available now, and the ARC 5 A550M and ARC 7 A730M and A770M available in the summer, early summer actually, so maybe that's an indication that they won't wait until September. Note that the frequencies listed here are Intel's graphics clock values, which they're defining as the average gaming clock speed versus a base boost clock or a peak frequency. They say they're being conservative with those numbers as well, which I personally think is the right way to go, but we'll see how actual measurements in third-party testing plays out to be sure. And that's pretty much it. 
Yes, there was more on features like XESS, Intel's hardware accelerated super sampling technology that works in a similar fashion to Nvidia's DLSS, and the media engine info is great news for streamers and content creators with a huge range of display resolutions up to 8K supported, and ARC GPUs notably being the first with full AV1 hardware accelerated encode and decode support. We'll now have to wait for streaming services like Twitch and YouTube to support AV1 ingestion as well, but with consumer hardware on the market now, that should come along eventually too. What will also be coming along is benchmark results, but remember that ARC 3 GPUs are towards the entry level point, so don't get your hopes up too much. Some initial 3D mark results posted to Twitter by Harukaze5719, who follows me, hey, I'll give him a follow back. But they show the A350M hitting Fire Strike and Time Spy scores that can't even really properly keep up with an NVIDIA GTX 1050 Ti, the mobile version. AMD jumped in as well with a benchmark chart that they posted to Twitter. That shows the Radeon 6500M handily outperforming the A370M despite being a much smaller chip. But do note that these numbers are directly from AMD, a direct competitor. They do not list other details like system specs in the image. AMD might also consider pitching a mobile GPU that people can actually buy as laptops sporting the 6500M are still pretty tough to come by. Oh, and there is one last thing. There was a hidden message in the Intel video and those who noticed found different shapes and the points on the shapes indicated an IP address and that IP address led to a secret video containing the answers to all of life's greatest mysteries. I'm just kidding. It was actually a bunch of the Intel graphics team members saying thank you to the community. You know, it was kind of cute. I like this part with Ryan. I always like to give him a shroud out. <laughs> okay. Speaking of things that are super cute, how about that new RTX 3090 Ti? Maybe cute isn't the word. Massive, gargantuan, a planet-sized GPU that lesser cards orbit around. Uh, it's a big boy, is what most reviewers pointed out when Nvidia's new top-end and presumably final card in the 30 series launched Tuesday. And the size is most definitely because cards that consume much power must also dissipate much heat. And as predicted last week, many 3090 Ti variants feature the new 12VH power connector that can feed a card 450 watts in 12-pin dumb mode, or up to 600 watts if you have a new power supply that can do the full 16-pin smart mode. And as we should have predicted, there are already a couple cards that use two of these damn things, allowing EVGA's RTX 3090 Ti Kingpin Edition, or Galaxy's RTX 3090 Ti Hall of Fame OC Lab Edition to theoretically pull up to 1,275 watts of power from your poor, poor overworked power supply without even accounting for any of the other components in your system. So you probably wouldn't be blamed for stocking up on fire extinguishers or wiring your home with a new 220 volt circuit, but don't be surprised if an old timer who remembers the Fermi days and Nvidia's GeForce 400 series looks over and asks, first time? Sure, a GTX 480 only has a 250 watt TDP, but third party models went higher than that and you could still set them up in four way SLI back then. That said, the RTX 3090 Ti launch was somewhat predictable with performance uplift over the RTX 3090, generally sitting in the five to 10% range, despite the 100 to 150 watt increased power draw and 33% price bump in MSRP from 1500 bucks to 2000. Speaking of GPU MSRPs though, it's possible that the best news from the past week was from Asus, who directly told PC Gamer that they would be dropping their GPU prices by reducing MSRP aggressively in April. Asus even sent a PR email out with the news, citing the recent 25% tariff exemptions that I also discussed last week as the key reason. Expect prices to decline up to 25% on different models throughout the springtime, they said, and while this does mean that the price changes will largely affect the US market, there are other factors at play as well, such as new GPU families coming to market from Nvidia and AMD, continued uncertainty about the viability of GPU cryptocurrency mining due to the pending Ethereum merge, and of course, Intel entering the discrete GPU market in earnest for the first time. Manufacturers like Asus prefer to make and then sell their products as quickly as possible, and all these things could contribute to a slowdown in sales for existing GPU families on the market. So dropping prices to encourage sales is both good for them and good for consumers. Let's hope the trend continues. Or maybe it won't. I know, 
but I've been talking about GPU prices dropping a lot in 2022, and every time I do, there's a negative Nelly in the comments saying, well, what about the neon supply, or something something Taiwan, or any number of other reasons why it might all come crashing down on us yet again. So let's address that and see what this doom and gloom article from Wired says about the global supply chain crisis It was published on Monday. First, COVID is still a big problem, and particularly in China, they have extreme requirements for outbreaks that occur. Shenzhen shut down just a couple weeks ago, and now Shanghai is on lockdown due to strict zero COVID policies that can throw supply chain logistics into disarray. Russia's damnable war with Ukraine causes further complications as rail lines that bring goods to the EU are shut down and shipments have to be transported by sea instead. Commodities that are key to tech manufacturing, such as nickel and aluminum, are seeing limited supply and rising prices too. And there's always the specter of corruption to consider, as bad actors will inevitably use these conditions as an excuse to raise prices or limit supply even if they are not directly affected. So we should temper our expectations somewhat in light of this information, yes, while also of course recognizing that those who might be experiencing shortages of food or other necessities are much worse off and therefore deserving of assistance and support versus a gamer who is in need of a GPU upgrade, even if you are actually still running a GTX 480. That said, there are other contributing factors related to GPU prices that could still result in continued price drops, even if we are looking at a resurgence in supply chain problems elsewhere. But hopefully the super smart people running the logistics show can get things figured out before the end of summer is upon us though, because that's when we're really expecting some advances in consumer PC technology, and high up on that list is AMD's next generation AM5 platform, which will introduce the LGA 1718 socket with support for Ryzen 7000 series CPUs currently codenamed Raphael. Twitter tech oracle Graymon55 boldly stated Tuesday that Raphael is about to enter mass production, a critical point in the product life cycle that typically precedes a full launch by only a few months. Videocards.com points out that AMD's Vermeer, or Zen 3 desktop CPUs, entered mass production in July 2020, and then launched four months later in November. So four months would be like from April to August, or from May to September, and that would seem a possibility if Graymon's info is accurate. And this would also align with rumors from February that said Zen 4 by summertime, which incidentally also came from Graymon 55, but I digress, as Jay says. And like I said earlier, summer doesn't technically end even until late September. But either way, AMD and Intel both have new CPUs planned later in the year, with Intel's 13th gen CPUs that will still be compatible with existing LGA 1700 motherboards also in queue, so both will likely be pushing to get theirs to market first. Speaking of the importance of speed, the only thing faster than tech briefs is how quickly they drop. Bungie was none too pleased that Destiny 2 YouTube videos were being flagged for copyright violation and taken down, and they have now filed suit against 10 unnamed perpetrators in response. Videos by well-known Destiny 2 content creators such as My Name is Biff and Aztec Cross were flagged with DMCA takedown notices, which Bungie says are not legit and caused a copyright strike for the channels affected. They had harsh words for YouTube as well, stating that their DMCA policies are flawed and create a gaping security loophole, allowing anyone, including a disgruntled infringer or a competitive content producer, to issue unverified takedowns. Maybe Bungie is especially frustrated because they received the same treatment that many independent YouTubers get, having to deal with a weekend-long litany of escalation and runaround before getting any substantive response from Google or YouTube. And I agree. Speaking of gaping holes, Intuit, the maker of TurboTax, is being sued by the FTC to stop deceptive ads that claim their software is free. In several ads, the word free is repeated over 40 times in a 30-second ad, the FTC said, claiming Intuit uses deceptive tactics to push customers toward paid products, even when they were eligible for the IRS's no-cost free file program. Fine print disclaimers are only shown briefly in a font color similar to the background color and are not read by voiceover. Add to this that TurboTax has changed how they define a simple tax return multiple times in the past few years, the hard stops in the software that seem to leave no option but to pay for an upgrade, or the fact that Intuit has used Google paid search to redirect customers searching for the IRS free file program to their paid site. And yeah, I have to say I'm not a fan of any of this. It's April, people are doing their taxes in the US, and if you were about to and you were gonna use TurboTax, consider using the link I put in the description to the IRS free filing portal if any of you are looking for a much better alternative to do your taxes without paying a company who actively lobbies to keep the tax system more complicated so they can continue to have a reason to exist. 
exist. Speaking of things that shouldn't exist, active cooling on SSDs. Actually, anything with a very small fan in a PC is often a bad idea in the long term, but apparently some PCIe 5.0 SSDs will get so hot they'll require active cooling. A blog post from SSD controller manufacturer Fizon discusses the problem and ways to mitigate it. For example, a tower-style cooler with a fan for M.2 SSDs might exist as an aftermarket product on Amazon right now, but integrating something like that into a laptop would be a challenge. A process shrink could help. Much of today's NAND is manufactured on 16 nanometer, but switching to 7 nanometer could reduce power usage and heat output. Ultimately, there will likely be a need for a new connection standard, though, as speeds increase but uh, there's no mention of what that will be. M.3? N.2? Until then, custom water cooling enthusiasts might have one more toasty component to try to work into their open loop. Speaking of things getting a little heated, Intel's new stock CPU cooler design can get warm, but seems to be more tolerable for budget builders thanks to its aesthetic upgrades. But a modder named Patrick Benne decided to see if performance could be improved, and he found that the answer was yes, and to do it, he used a piece of paper. As detailed in his blog, after some testing, he found out that a 1.7 inch tall cowl made of paper placed inside the plastic fins but outside the metal heatsink significantly reduced noise output while temps remain the same. He even included some noise tests, like this is without it. This is with it. Way better. So if you're using a stock Intel 12th gen cooler, maybe try this out yourself. All you need is some paper and probably some scissors. E3 is an event that I never really covered much, partially because it's mostly focused on games, and I mostly focus on PC hardware, and also it's usually right after Computex, and I'm jet lagged. This year was totally gonna be different though, maybe, but then they canceled the in-person event back in January, and I haven't thought about it since. But now even digital E3 is canceled, so we can't even remotely join in to experience whatever it is E3 is all about, but maybe it's for the best. It's a rebuilding year, it turns out, and the ESA released a statement saying, E3 will return in 2023 with a reinvigorated showcase. I don't really know what that means. Speaking of things I don't understand, why does Microsoft insist on this constant love-hate relationship with Windows users? It seems like every week I either have some new cool thing they did with Windows to talk about or some shitty anti-consumer garbage they did to try to get us to use Bing again. But we're almost to the end of this video and I wanted to end on a positive note. So fortunately, this week the news seems to be good. Microsoft is fixing the default web browser function that they intentionally broke themselves when Windows 11 launched. Because those are you sure pop-up apparently weren't enough to keep people on their Edge browser, Windows 11 forced you to change default app behavior by file type and link type, meaning you had to switch about 10 default settings if you just wanted the OS to use Firefox or the Chrome browser by default. It was transparently dumb, obvious in its intent, and thankfully they're switching back to a one setting option. So thanks Microsoft, I guess, for fixing that thing that you broke on purpose. And thanks to you guys for joining me today. That's all for the tech news for the week. And if you liked it, uh, click the like button to convey that feeling to me so that I may feel it too. Speaking of feelings, your feedback is always welcome. So please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description. If you're interested, you can also check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise, t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. I've got some new designs coming this month too. And if you're not subscribed, well, that's your choice, but I'd suggest otherwise. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next week.